Hello and welcome to the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks Landscape Conservation Cooperatives webinar presenting the results of a project entitled Mapping Ecosystem Services for the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks Region. Today we will present the ecosystem service mapping results of a three-part project that focuses on nature's benefits important to private landowners. Additional parts of this project will be presented separately. They include a survey of landowner values and a social network analysis aimed at improving landowner engagement. Some background on the GCPO LCC. We are part of a national network of 22 landscape conservation cooperatives that cover the entire U.S. LCC focus, LCC's focus on strategic conservation at a large or landscape scale that will be adaptive to future change. The GCPO focuses on a 180 million acre geography that covers all of Arkansas and Mississippi and portions of 10 other states centered around the lower Mississippi River. Today I have the honor of introducing Sarah Mason. Sarah works as a policy research associate at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke University. She received her Master's of Environmental Management degree from Duke, focusing in ecosystem science and conservation. Sarah is part of the Ecosystem Services Program at the Nicholas Institute and works as one of the coordinators for the National Ecosystem Services Partnership. Her work currently focuses on ways to integrate ecosystem services into decision making. Sarah, I hand it over to you. All right, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, I want to thank Greg for giving me that nice introduction. Um, and I just want to you know, start out by saying it was most certainly not just me doing this project. Um, it was a collaboration between the Nicholas Institute at Duke, uh, Mississippi State, and with support of the GCPO um, LCC. And I just want to um, acknowledge everyone, at least in writing, who helped to collaborate on this project. Um, it, was, it was a big group effort. Um, and with that, I will let um, Greg put up the first poll question just to get an idea of who's attending today. Okay, I'll launch the uh, first poll now. It asks you to give a description of uh, how you would uh, organize yourself or describe yourself for the purposes of uh, us doing uh, some feedback on the on the, the webinar today. And I'm giving you 60 seconds to answer this question before I show the results. Okay, we've got about 80% uh, voted here, about five more seconds to go, and I'm going to close it. With 80% answering, here are the results. We've got uh, 9% research scientists, 31% federal research scientists. That was 9% state, 14% uh, university research scientist, 17% consultant, and 29% conservation implementation outreach of any type. So a real balanced uh, mix of, of participants here today. And I will be closing this and handing it back to in just a second. Come on. Okay. So. Okay. I think I have it back. Uh, all right. So just to start out. Um, you know, why we decided to sort of do this project. Um, there are really two trends in conservation programming that we wanted to explore. The first being that conservation is being done more and more at a landscape level. 
um, which means cooperation is needed even more between disparate stakeholders. And this includes public and private groups um, and other individuals. And it also implies there has to be increased cooperation and coordination with private landowners, especially in places like the eastern and um, sort of south central U.S. where private land ownership represents the majority of land ownership. Um, the second trend we were kind of looking at was that conservation programs are often focusing more and more on ecosystems, which can be further extended to ecosystem services and, you know, how nature and people interact. So we really wanted to um, examine and acknowledge the entire socio-ecological system rather than analyzing and planning for each of these um, elements separately. And so um, the, the project was kind of two-pronged. First, we wanted to provide the um, GCPO with usable information about the socio-ecological system. It's pretty basic. But um, second, we wanted to create a transferable model for information and data gathering that could be used in other parts of the U.S., uh, potentially for other LCCs that are trying to gather this type of data. Um, and uh, Greg gave a pretty good background on the LCC, but um, you know it is one of um, 22 in the national network of LCCs, and these are sort of conservation science partnerships that give both scientific and technical support for conservation. And um, Here's just a map to give you an idea of, of where the, uh, the region of interest is, um, although it seems like many people may already be working in this region. Um, there were sort of three interrelated pieces to the project, as was mentioned earlier, and the primary goal was to identify opportunities to engage private landowners in the um, Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks LCC in conservation and restoration activities and to do this by focusing on ecosystem service outcomes that were important to them. So to do, to do this and to sort of examine this, there were three distinct but related pieces of work that went in. Um, the first was a survey of landowners to identify what services are important to them and how willing they are to engage in various conservation or restoration activities. The second was a social network analysis to understand how um, to best engage private landowners across the region. And then the, th the third part, which is what I'll focus on today, is um, the sort of course res resolution mapping of the provision and then where possible demand for ecosystem services in the region. Um, and I think as was previously mentioned, there might be more detailed webinars in the sort of coming months on the first two aspects of the project. But to just really quickly um, go over these first two parts to give an idea of sort of the project scope. Um, I wanted to quickly uh, talk about the survey and the social network analysis. So Mississippi State led the survey on landowner willingness to participate in conservation and restoration activities. And it included questions on things like the number of acres of forest or agricultural land owned, um, the reason for owning land, level of concern about different environmental issues like soil erosion or deforestation or loss of pollinators, um, level of engagement with various land management agencies or organizations in the region, and this includes federal and state agencies and also national and local conservation organizations. And then also um, landowners' willingness to accept payments for implementing various conservation practices. So just um, to give an idea of some of the examples of the types of outputs that were created from the survey. survey. Um, this analysis is still in process, but these are some of the sort of preliminary maps that we're, we're getting from, um, from our collaborators at Mississippi State. This map um, details landowner satisfaction with the NRCS, the Natural Resource Conservation Service, and this was done on a scale of one to five with answers aggregated by zip code. Um, the second map shows the um, variation in landowner concern about loss of forests, so that shows something kind of different, but it's, it's aggregated in that same way. And then this map um, shows the bid price that landowners are willing to accept for putting their land into a conservation easement for 10 years. To quickly go over the social network analysis, um, the, the social network analysis also used the survey results um, from that survey I just talked about, but they use the results pertaining to landowner engagement with conservation organizations. 
And it really aimed to answer two questions. Um, the first was, which agencies or groups are most or maybe least central in the network? Uh, sort of getting at which organizations would be most effective in engaging landowners and being the face of certain conservation programs. And this is uh, based on the number of connections that they already have within the network. And then the second question um, asked which groups of organizations in the network currently already have strong working relationships and how can these groups be mobilized to meet the broader objectives, uh, the conservation objectives of this network. So um, which agencies are already poised to effectively work together based upon the fact that they already have existing connections. So this was looking at both connections between landowners and these conservation organizations and then also connections between the conservation organizations themselves. And so to, to get into the ecosystem service mapping portion, which is what we'll be focusing on today, um, the, the, the mapping was also sort of related to the two-pronged nature of the project. So again, the, the first motivation was to give uh, the GCPO managers an idea of where services are provided across the landscape and how they vary. So as managers aim to implement various programs across the GCPO area, it's important to know how different ecosystem services vary across the landscape, where is there a lot of provision and where might it be lacking. Um, the second motivation was to determine if this type of project could be done using only publicly available national scale data sets. Um, and if so, we wanted to create a methodology that could be transferable to other areas of the country and potentially other LCCs. And we, we didn't want this only to be transferable, but also relatively easy to replicate. And we wanted to try and do this without really advanced modeling. And since it is such a large area, we, we aim to give managers a way to scan the landscape for ecosystem services and then really hone in on areas that might be important for additional data collection or more advanced analysis techniques. So we identified ecosystem services that might be enhanced or even reduced by conserving all-terrain management or restoring habitats in the GCPO region using conceptual models like this one. And uh, the example conceptual model here depicts the effects that um, either conservation or restoration may have on a suite of services related to crop and food production. But this is just one of um, quite a few of these diagrams that we created, but I, I just put this one up for an example. And um, the effects start with expected ecological changes that would eventually lead to a change in ecosystem service production and thus a change in benefits to people. So the green boxes are changes to ecological stocks and flows. Orange boxes are a linking point between ecological production and social benefit. And then blue boxes are social benefit or value to people, which can be a monetary value, but it doesn't have to be. And then it's, it's important to note that the better measures of ecosystem services are going to be further to the right on these chains, as they are going to be the indicators that better describe the magnitude of benefits to people. Um, but with the available data and the type of data that we were looking for, we weren't always able to map these ideal indicators. Um, but if you read our report, which I'll provide a link to later, um, we detail any sort of caveats or discussions about drawbacks to data in detail in this report. So we, we tried to be really transparent about things like that. Um, I wanted to quickly go over um, how we used EnviroAtlas because if you're familiar with EnviroAtlas, you might be thinking, well, why did they try to find national scale publicly available data sets on ecosystem services when there's a perfectly great tool already that does this, provided by the EPA? Um, and this is true. <laughs> it was incredibly useful in this process, and it is a free national scale data set. Um, but we did run into some issues with it. So for some services, we, we just sort of cite EnviroAtlas and said, great, this is an output that we can use and suggest for the, the GCPO to, to utilize. But for other services, there were limitations in the EnviroAtlas data that led us to search for other data sets. So just in this ex as an example, um, this map right here shows 
currently what's available for vertebrate biodiversity and um, vertebrate species richness um, in, in the EnviroAlice data set right now. And as you can see, there's a pretty large gap in the middle that covers a large portion of the, the study area that we were looking at. Um, so this was really just an extent issue um, with the data. But for other data sets that um, EnviroAtlas uses, um, the, the definitions of the EnviroAtlas ecosystem service, if you sort of dig down into how the data, data layer was produced, it just didn't quite match with what we wanted to map. So we just we looked for other data sources. So we were able to relatively easily collect data on nine different ecosystem services shown here. And we got some measure of all of the different types of services. So some provisioning, some regulating, some supporting, and then some more cultural services. And as you can see from this table, um, most of our data sources were government agencies, but some data was collected from other locations. Um, almost all of it was publicly available. We did have to request a few different um, data layers and uh, sort of details of how we requested that are also in the report. Um, but they were really relatively easily obtained with a simple request and people from these sources seemed happy to share the data. Um, and if anyone has trouble downloading this type of data um, for other regions in the country, I'd be happy to sort of help out and, and share our method for getting that data. Um, data is at different scales. Some was aggregated to the HUC-12 level, some to the county level, and some are at neither. Um, and while this gives good variation um, across the region, the scale of the data is another limitation that we're working with. Um, some of these national data sets are not collected with aggregating at this scale in mind. Um, and again, we're clear about these limitations and, and really emphasize the use of these layers as a scanning apparatus and not as a final decision maker. Um, the other kind of cool thing that we did with the mapping was to distinguish between areas to focus on for conservation and areas to focus on for restoration. So many studies um, quantify ecosystem services. If you're familiar with the ecosystem services sort of mapping literature, you'll see this a lot. Um, many studies quantify services provided and then kind of show service hotspots where multiple services overlap. Um, and this is something that we do, as you'll see in later slides. But we kind of wanted to extend the utility of our data layers a little bit. So to take our pollination data as an example, we have on the left a map that shows um, areas highlighted as important for pollinator habitat conservation. So these are areas where demand for pollinator services is high. Um, there are large areas of pollinator benefited crops in these areas, but these are also regions where supply of pollinator services is high. So there's a large probability of pollinator visitation based on the proximity of pollinator habitats to these crops that need the pollinators. So these are areas where it's important to um, conserve existing pollinator habitat because it exists where it's already needed. Um, the map on the right shows, alternatively, um, areas highlighted as important for pollinator habitat restoration. So these are also areas where demand for pollinator services is high. There are still crops that need pollinators. But there's a relatively low supply of pollinator services. Um, represented by a low probability of pollinator visitation based on proximity of these pollinator habitats. Uh, I, I just wanted to give an idea of sort of the types of data that we're presenting here, so I'm just going to go quickly into a bit more detail about a few other of our output layers. Um, and, and this is just kind of a, a quick skim. If you are interested, you're, you're welcome to read our report, and it goes into a lot more detail about all the different layers that we, we collected. But um, biodiversity is the first one I'm going to go over. And um, biodiversity is a good example of a service where we really had no good data on demand or on value as a way to enhance our outputs beyond saying kind of this is where various types of biodiversity exist in the region. Um, we collected various data sets that we thought could be helpful for estimating um, biodiversity or different aspects of biodiversity. And uh, you can see here three of those data layers. The first on the left is the number of vertebrate species per HUP12. 
And as you can see, um, this, this is that data from EnviroAtlas, and half of the study region doesn't contain any data because the, the um, GCPO kind of falls right along that line um, of data availability in, in the EnviroAtlas data. So that data layer is pretty limited in terms of its use just because it doesn't um, cover the entire region. Um, the second map in the middle shows the number of rare species per HUC12, and these are rare species as defined by NatureServe. And then the, the map on the right shows essential habitats for threatened and endangered species as defined by the Endangered Species Act. Um, and these, these are the habitats that fall within the GCPO region. So to move on to something slightly more complicated than those biodiversity maps, we used a relative measure of water filtration to estimate water quality improvements. And kind of in a nutshell, what we did was to take um, the flow path from every non-point source pollutant um, cell in the region and then count the length of riparian buffer that it traveled through before it reaches, reached a stream. So we kind of counted that riparian buffer as a, as a filtering mechanism. And then we aggregated the data by hook to get the average buffer length for each non-point source cell in that hook. Um, this is not advanced hydrological modeling by any means, but we have talked to a few different um, hydrologists and they seem to agree that it would help to identify areas where increased scrutiny might, or <laughs> scrutiny might be warranted. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good first cut at this type of data. And so the results of that analysis that I just talked about um, are shown on the map on the left. Um, we then used the non-point source um, pollutant or uh, cell coverage and this left-hand map to identify areas important for conservation and restoration, just like we did for pollination. So this uh, top map on the right here is conservation priority areas. So this is where there's high non-point source pollution coverage or non-point source pollutant coverage. Um, and these, this non-point source pollution is coming mainly from agriculture and, agricultural and urban areas. Um, but it's, these are areas that also rel contain relatively high buffer widths. Um, so it's important to maintain or conserve those buffers that are already doing what they need to be doing, filtering out these, um, these non-point source pollutants. Alternatively, the bottom map um, on the right shows where restoration might be warranted. These are areas where non-point source coverage is also high, but buffer lengths are low. So more buffers could be restored to help filter water coming from those non-point sources. Um, this is the last example set of layers that I'll show, and it's for our carbon data. Um, the left-hand map simply shows the amount of above and below ground carbon found in each county in the GCPO region. Um, and then we sort of did a few things beyond examining what carbon is already there. So um, this map on the right is, shows the results of a, a sort of basic analysis examining how much potential additional carbon could be stored on private lands in the region. And we use this equation that you see along the bottom to look at the difference between carbon storage in poorly stocked and fully stocked private forests in each county. And then we said, what if all those poorly stocked forests were brought up to a fully stocked level? Um, how much additional carbon could these forests potentially hold? And, and that the results of that are what you see in this map here. Again, this is a pretty basic analysis, but it gives a good idea of where you might want to look closer at, um, at places where you could be looking at more fully stocking forests. Um, we also did a conservation versus restoration analysis for carbon as well. So in counties with high current carbon storage and high current forested area, we marked as important for conservation of existing forest carbon. Um, and then uh, in counties with high carbon storage but low forest acreages, we marked as areas to examine for forest restoration um, to store potential future carbon since these areas have the potential to host high carbon forests but don't currently contain a lot of forests and land. 
Okay, so um, we wanted to include in our report some examples of how these data layers could be combined to answer different hypothetical management questions. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to provide briefly um, explanations of three of these um, sort of um, case study management questions to just give an idea of the, the utility of our data. In this first example, we combine data sets to show where managers could promote conservation of existing water quality ecosystem services where they're needed. So in other words, where non-point sources of pollution exist, and then the associated co-benefit services that would accompany that conservation. So we isolated areas where non-point source presence was high, but natural habitat water filtration services were already provided and then found overlap with other service layers that we had created. So the different colors on this map represent different suites of ecosystem services that would be conserved if these um, sort of water filtration areas were protected. The second example, um, we sort of created a case where our hypothetical managers want to locate agricultural lands that could be restored to natural habitats. Um, but our managers want to do this with the least opportunity cost so we took counties where there were relatively large cropland areas, but then relatively low dollar per acre values for crops, and then found where those counties overlapped with other service layers. Um, and again, the different colors represent different sort of suites of ecosystem services that, um, that could be restored if these crop areas were restored to natural habitats. And then finally, um, we wanted to sort of bring in the survey data to um, sort of combine different elements of the project. So this final hypothetical case um, used that, that Mississippi State survey data collected. Um, and we wanted to find areas in the landscape where carbon storage was ranked as important to landowners. And this was sort of with the assumption that um, conservation programs targeting carbon storage would be that much more successful in those areas where it is already important to landowners. So we then asked, within these areas where carbon is already valued, should managers focus on carbon conservation or carbon restoration programs? And then what are the associated co-benefits with each? So to do that, we chose our focal area, which you can see in the inset map here. Um, and we did that by using zip codes where landowners had ranked carbon sequestration as either very important or essential. So we kind of zoomed in on that area. And then we took our carbon conservation layer and mapped its associated co-benefits, which are shown in blue, and overlaid the carbon restoration layer and its co-benefits, which are shown in green. And then um, managers could take this information and try to decide how they might want to proceed. You know, should they aim for conservation or restoration? Are there particular associated co-benefit services that they particularly want to target? Um, and are they enhanced in, in either of these scenarios? So in general, overlaying the survey and ecosystem services data can help to answer questions about how the potential provision of ecosystem services overlaps with landowner interest in these services and their willingness to participate in conservation and management programs. Um, because we do want to promote this methodology as a relatively low-cost transferable model, um, we want it, again, to be transparent and sort of price it out so that other groups or organizations could, could try to plan for something like this if it's something that they're interested in. So we estimate that the ecosystem service mapping work would likely cost um, roughly $6,800 based on the fact that new work could use the same data sources and techniques that we used um, which are again all written up in the report. Um, and the, the costs would, however, go up drastically or potentially drastically for different ecosystem services or different ecosystem types where the ecosystem services might be different and new kinds of analyses would have to be done. Um, adding in the survey data does require somewhat significant additional costs, which you can see here. Um, but the, the amount is going to depend on how many respondents you want to get um, and how large an area you're looking at. And then um, adding in the social network analysis, again, requires a trained analyst and, and a good amount of work, but um, is, again, not horribly expensive. 
So, um, you know, somewhere between $35,000 and $50,000 can get you a, 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 an attainable cost for a helpful project that hopefully provides important informa information about a, a pretty large landscape area. So to, to sort of bring it all back together, we have the three different parts to this project. And to continue with the previous example I was just talking about with carbon, um, the managers at the LCC could take what they learned from our maps, which are already targeted to areas where landowners care about this particular service, and then use the social network analysis to determine the best ways to then actually reach out to these landowners and implement these programs. You know, which organizations are landowners actually going to listen to and respond to? So the, the different aspects of this project really sort of complement each other nicely and allow for landscape scale planning that, that acknowledges and incorporates ecosystem services while coordinating with the values and concerns of private landowners. So with that, I will end. Um, I'm going to provide my information and a link to the report. I think um, Toby has one more poll question about how access to this um, information might be most useful, and then we'll go into the Q&A. Um, Greg, do you see the poll on your dashboard? Because I'm not seeing it. Let me check. I, I know I saw it before. I'll go ahead and launch this poll. So, based on what you saw and heard today, in what format would you be most likely to find or obtain these results? So this is the idea is here we want to disseminate this information to others like you and what do you think would be the best way of doing that? And then while people are uh, putting their answers in, I want to remind you that you can submit a question in the question box or there's also a raise your hand function um, on your dashboard that we can use to address questions as soon as we're done here. So we have about 85 people have voted. I'm going to close the poll in about five seconds. So here are our results. Everybody, uh, it seems like the, um, a plurality of people want the web-enabled platforms, which we already have uh, in, our, in our LCC. And I'm sure you're going to end up seeing some of these data sets on our platform. And then the next most popular answer was a technical report. And I'll just close this and hand it back to Sarah. We have one question. Well, we have several questions coming in here. Okay. Would you mind, um, I think Lydia Olander is on the line and she was another um, sort of PI on this project and she might be also helpful to answer questions. Okay, yes. Yeah, so you could just unmute her. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Lydia, you can get on now. Great, thank you. And so let me see, the first question was from Craig Diamond. I'm going to unmute Craig. Craig, do you want to ask, ask a question? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, no, I just wanted to go ahead and confirm that that the presentation I said I see it's being recorded was was going to be made available afterwards, uh, just to review and and uh, you know make contact to the presenters. Yeah, we'll definitely have the recording. And you mentioned you'd like to have um, the PowerPoint. Should we share the PowerPoint, Sarah? Uh, that's perfectly fine. Or PDF yeah. version of it. Yeah. 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 Thank. You. That's great. Thank you. Okay, thanks. All right. Next question is Mark Russell. And I am going to unmute Mark. Are you there, Mark? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I was just wondering about the conclusions from the network analysis. I saw the the network itself, but are there are take home points from that. Yeah, so um, I don't have them in front of me. They're actually being submitted for publication right now. Um, I can 
uh, put you in touch with the person who ran that. That, that wasn't um, something that I was a part of, but um, I can put you in touch with that person and, um, and he can uh, give you the results. I, I don't know, you know what his policy is for sharing things since it's sort of get, getting ready to be published, but I'm sure he would be happy to make those results available to you. Yeah, and I'd also like to point out that we, at some point, we, it hasn't been determined yet, but we will be having another webinar to present that, that half of the project. And this is Lydia. I could note that there are a number of different network analyses that were done with the data, looking at different aspects of the relationships between those organizations and different landowners. So um, there it would be worth the webinar if there's, there's time to do that at some point. Yeah, definitely. Okay, we have another question here from Lauren Hutchison. Lauren, I've unmuted you. Are you there? She may have stepped away. I'm just going to read her question. It says, uh, great wor work with real world application. Uh, are the data layers you created publicly available? Um, so the layers I created, I I have them ready. Um, I'm working with the GCPO to get them up, I think, on the conservation, what is it, the planning atlas. Um, but again, in the report, there's links to all of the original data sources. So if you're working either in the, the Gulf Coast region or somewhere else, um, all of the sort of methods I use to get my data layers are available as well. And another thing to think about is that the data layers and how you use them can be adapted by the user. So we to do some of the layering that you saw that Sarah did, we had to put thresholds into place in terms of what we considered in or out in terms of being a conservation or restoration priority. And you could change those thresholds if you had different ideas of where they should be. So I just think it, it's worth reading enough into this to adapt the data for your needs rather than just take the layers as they're created because you may have variations on how you'd like to use them. Great, thanks for that. And then we have another great question here from Mark. Mark, I've unmuted you again. You want to ask your question? Yeah, so I know there's a lot of other services other than the ones that were covered here, and I was just curious about which ones you may have liked to include in this, but you just couldn't uh, due to various reasons. Yeah, um, you know, it, it was really based on data availability. We, we um, because we're working in such a large region and because we were looking for only free publicly available data, um, we limited ourselves in some ways. So. Um, we didn't really have much on um, recreation in terms of anything sort of beyond birding or hunting. Um, we didn't have much on um, sort of cultural services that were, you know, looking at, again, data beyond something like hunting. So, um, you know, any, any regions that are important for spiritual or other values like that. We just we just didn't have the data at this scale to do an analysis like that right now. Um, but you know it, those 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 services are are definitely worthwhile and shouldn't be ignored. They just weren't included at this point. We also thought about doing a view shed assessment, but again, thought that it didn't make much sense at the scale we were looking. So, a number of different services that could be added. Great. So, we have some more questions coming in. Um, Emily Trentacost, who is not on the phone, sent in a question. She said, How did you go about deciding which services and layers would be considered co benefits in the examples you showed? Um, honestly, those examples, because they were hypothetical management scenarios, it was relatively arbitrary. We just kind of said, what do we think these managers are going to think is important today? Um, but again, in, in like Lydia was talking about, in a sort of real world application, not only would you be choosing the layers that were most important to you um, and the sort of co-benefits that were most important to you, 
but you'd also be applying a threshold in a way that was meaningful for whatever you were doing um, with the with the various data layers that you'd be using. Um, so, you know, I can't say that the co-benefits we chose were thought out, you know, you know, anything beyond this sort of makes sense for, for a management perspective. One thing that, that might be possible to do, especially if you're starting targeting different regions within a larger area like the, the, L, the Gulf Coast LPC, would be to, um, to think about that start using the survey data and what's important to landowners in different regions. So if it varies, that might be one way of selecting which co-benefits might be important. And that carbon example is one of those um, where she um, shows an example that targeted in on a region where carbon was important, forest carbon was important to landowners. Okay, our next question is from George Otto, and I'm going to unmute you. George, are you there? Do you have a question? Sounds like it's not working. <laughs> I'm going to mute George, and I'm going to go ahead and read his question. He said, did you field check model output or determine some type of confidence? Um... So, I guess I'm not sure. Is um, We do talk about variance and variation in the data in our report. Um, that was something I kind of skimmed over in this presentation. Um, but most of the data is not based on modeling. Um, but we, we do, you know, that the, the water quality data was. Um, and and we have we have information on the, the variation and variance. Um, I just I just didn't include it in this presentation. Okay, and our next question is from George Wilson. Uh, let's see, I'm going to try and unmute him. Are you there, George? Okay, I'm just going to read this question. He says, can ecosystem services staff with major forest landowners participate in your data searches? Can ecosystem services staff with major forest landowners participate in your data searches? Um, I'm not completely sure of the question. <laughs> Are you there, George? Uh, not, not verbally. We can barely hear you. I'm kind of guessing that maybe if, if, if this person works with major forest landowners and tries to do their own ecosystem services work, they're asking if they can participate in your data searches or, or collaborate with you in some way. I mean, yes, we're, we're open to that. Um, and you know, again, I'd be happy to share either the types of survey questions we used or the types of data collection that we did. Um, and it's always good to hear of someone on the ground doing this type of work um, and, and what types of questions they might be asking um, as well. So yes, I was <laughs> that, that would be fine. All right, and we have one more question here from Mark Russell again. So I will yeah. see. Go ahead. Um, so other than the carbon storage uh, that was already identified, what other functions did landowners identify as being important for delivering services? Um, what, what services did they value or what function? Well, carbon storage to me is an is a ecosystem function. It's related to okay. climate mitigation, right? So, what other things did they identify as important, either functions or services, I guess? Yeah, sure. Um, I know that a lot of people were both concerned with the loss of pollinators and um, valued pollinator services. That was something um, that, was, that was of interest to many landowners. Um, a lot of people were also concerned with soil erosion. Um, I think that was more a lot of people who, who own more agricultural land. 
And then um, deforestation was another big one, or just loss of forest in general. I think that's probably tied into urbanization as well. Um, I can't, those are kind of the big ones that stick out in my mind. Um, again, I wasn't involved in the, the survey data analysis part of the project, and I, if there is that webinar on the, the survey um, part of the project, I'm sure they'll go into de more detail about that. But um, the, the people who did the survey are also um, preparing a report that should have more details on sort of the exact levels of interest in all of the different services that they asked about. You could just continue on, Mark, uh, because you're the last one in line with your question. Sure. So it's a related question uh, about carbon storage. So I'm curious why landowners down in that southern section identified the carbon storage as being important to them. I guess the question is sort of what do they get out of that? Is it um, less flooding? Is it less intense storms? Um, just seems like it was spatially aggregated down there near the Gulf, and I'm just curious if you have any insight into that. Um, I don't. <laughs> I would like to say that I do, but I that they didn't get into that much detail. Um, and again, I, I did not do the survey part of the project, so um, if there is any insight into that, I wouldn't be the one to ask. Uh, if, if you are really interested, though, I'd be happy to put you in touch with the people who did do the survey. I don't know that they would have an answer for you, but um, but they might. Okay, well that was a really great set of questions from our audience. Um, there aren't any more that have come in. Would you like to make any closing remarks, Sarah or Lydia? Um, I'd like to make one just addition. So Sarah was talking about the cost for transferring this work. and. Um, while I think it, it does increase costs to add services, I don't think it increases it um, astronomically. It's it's perhaps doubles, perhaps triples the cost, but since it's around six thousand dollars, it's not um, it, that much of a, a bump up um, to add other services in. I think one, now that we have a general sense for how to build out this this approach, um, you know, using a similar approach for other services will be less um, effort than it was the first time around. Um, but it'll still take additional additional cost. Um, but I, it was it was interesting to see once we asked all the different researchers what the cost would be for transferring this, and I, I think it's a reasonable. Uh, was a reasonably low cost altogether, um, potentially to repeat something like this in another region. So I, I, that was that was a nice thing to see. So it's fun to say that. And I also want to say thank you for hosting the call for us. Well, thank you for the great work that you guys did, and thank you to all every, all of our audience members for attending this webinar. And please be on the lookout for the announcement for the other webinar that uh, will address the survey and the social network analysis. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.